Hello. Uh, that back there is my book, Cupid Takes a Holiday. And uh, that down there is a link to the Amazon page where you can buy it on paperback or buy it for Kindle or read it for free on Kindle Unlimited. And, uh, you know, I would love if you bought it, but if you just want to read it and you have Kindle Unlimited, I would understand if you read it for free. And let me know what you think. Um, so the two Are You, Af Are you Afraid of the Dark episodes... Um, Dead Man's Float, which I recognized just from the title, and and this is how it appears on Paramount Plus, not on Wikipedia, but on Paramount Plus, The Tale of Station 109.1 featuring Ryan Gosling. That is how Paramount Plus has it listed, so that is how I will, I will refer to it. Um, if you were confused that Ryan Gosling is not here because the title of this video said featuring Ryan Gosling, I apologize, but that is what the episode is called according to Paramount Plus, where I watched it. Anyway, uh, these are the first two episodes of season five, and they introduce the character of Stig, who tells both stories, uh, because very interestingly, uh, as they reveal, after the first story, they take a vote, does Stig get in? Uh, and it is not unanimous, and it has to be unanimous in order for him to get in. I forget if they took a vote on Sam or, uh, Tucker in the same way. Maybe they went around the circle or something, but... Uh, it does. It's. It seems. It seemed like. Well, and he was a special case because he's kind of. Somebody calls him grungy at one point. I forget which one, but he was kind of like ninety. It represented nineties grunge, which Kiki, a little. She. She's. She's. She dresses, tomboyish, but also, like, could be con like with the backwards hat. Could be considered a little grunge, but she definitely didn't like him. And his hair was definitely. Uh, greasy, which whereas hers is she she has good hygiene. She just dresses like a like punk like, um, but uh, he dressed similar to her, but his hair was greasy, perhaps not washed, and they they said grunge. And Kiki is also the the main one who uh, objects to his uh, being there for reasons. Uh, apparent, I guess she knows him uh, previously, but as soon as the bag is taken off of his head uh, and he's revealed. He kisses her uh, on the cheek, and of course she doesn't like it, and, and we're not supposed to like him very much, uh, and so it kind of sets it up for this is going to be a little harder for him to, to get uh, in their good graces, and, which is an interesting dynamic to introduce. Uh, and again, I am finding on this second round uh, that I, as great as the stories are, uh, and both of these are pretty good stories. Um, the dynamic of the Midnight Society is more interesting to me this time. Anyway, getting to dead, the tale of the Dead Man's Float, um, we, we start with a, um, what is apparently, uh, a, uh, prologue, I guess, uh, takes place 50 years or so, let's see, where did it say, um, the, uh, I forget how, a, a long time ago. And there's a little kid in a pool, and um, the lifeguard is is uh, is assures him it's safe to go into the water. And then the lifeguard leaves to make out with the kid's sister. Uh, and then later on, the kid is screaming because there's something in the water, uh, something smelly. And the lifeguard goes in, tries to save him. It doesn't work. The lifeguard's name, notably, is Charlie. So then we flash forward to the main action of the story, where we meet. Uh, Zeke, who I thought they were saying Zeke, and I didn't really, I, I had a hard time with the names on this one, and the, 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 the girl in the story is named Clorice, not Clarice or Patrice, I thought, maybe Clorice, like Chlorine, and I have never heard uh, anyone called Clorice, Clarice, yes, um, but not Clorice. So anyway, Zeke and Clorice are the main characters in the story, uh, and... Uh, Zeke is, uh, well, he looks like Macaulay Culkin, uh, a little older than, uh, Home Alone days, but it's not Macaulay Culkin. Um, but he, and he, but he wears glasses and he's supposed to be a geeky character who's, who's very smart, too smart for his own good. Uh, the, the story opens with him, he's got, a, he's built a volcano for his science class and it exploded too much, but not dangerously, just, you know, people ducked, um, chemical reaction stuff. And, um, and then he's being made fun of by Clorice and her friend Greta. Uh, and her friend Greta is kind of a little interested in Zeke. Clorice is not. 
uh, but Clarice ends up being the one who gets uh, more time with him. Uh, and uh, then we and we meet Charlie again. Uh, you know, Zeke's going to clean up the mess he made, but then the teacher says Charlie can get it. And we see the janitor coming forward and say, ah, it's the same name as the lifeguard. He was a lifeguard, now he's the janitor. W wonder what happened all those years ago. Because he's a much older man with gray hair now. Um, so, let's see. Zeke uh, was trying, to, apparently he says he was trying to uh, discover the, uh, or measure the volume of the school, which is strange. And he says that this is how he discovered the pool hidden behind the lockers in the uh, boys' changing room. Uh, when he, he says to Clarice, because she's a swimmer, I think that uh, they previously arranged that he's going to help her with science or something like that, and he says he wants to show her this thing, and it's a pool that he discovered while trying to uh, calculate the volume of the school. Uh, it seems to me, this is another instance where it's a school with a huge unused portion and uh, and that seems like a strange trope, like schools would use all that they have. And with her, she says she's on the swim team. They have to take a bus to somewhere to practice, but they have their own pool, and she makes it her goal to get them to keep it open. But a room that size would be would not be a secret. Uh, people would have found a room that size out just walking around the school. Uh, so, yeah, that's... But it's, again, it needs necessary for the story. And maybe there's, uh, we don't really hear, but maybe there are stories connected to it. I don't But he, apparently, very smart kid, didn't realize it until, I guess, they're in high school. It looks like they're in high school. Uh, anyway, she convinces the school to reopen the pool so that they can use it. Um, while they, while she and Zeke are investigating it, after they leave, we see that Charlie's there. Charlie knows. Uh, I'm not, not sure why he's there, but then he looks down into the pool and a shape kind of rises, kind of bubbles up from the uh, bottom of it, but it's all, uh, tarp is over it, so we don't see what the shape is. Um, and it's and it still smells really bad, whatever that presence is. So, um, they, uh, they make a bargain, Grace and Zeke. Uh, Grace needs to pass, uh, get better grades in order to stay on the swim team, and Zeke wants to learn to swim. I wrote down his name as Zeke because I thought that's what, I thought it was like Stig Zeke. Um, so they, and he tells a story about how he was swimming in a pond and he was grabbed by plants and he almost drowned. Uh, and uh, that's why he has, hasn't had much luck with swimming. And so, um, and I don't know, it wasn't clear if he was going to help her with her uh, schoolwork to get better grades or just to do it for her. But it could go either way. Um, while they are in the pool, they kind of go out on a boat, a little like inflatable boat, uh, and Grace is trying to show Zeke that it's uh, safe and she gets pulled underwater. And it's scary, but it turns out it's just Greta who seems to be jealous that Clarice is now spending time with Zeke. Um, and uh, then they smell acid again, and Zeke sl has slid into the water with her for a lesson, but then he starts getting pulled under, and uh, then Charlie saves both of them. And this is when he explains that the pool opened 50 years ago or more. Three kids drowned in addition to the kid that uh, we met in the earlier, earlier in the episode. Um, he says that it was built on a cemetery, and they moved all the bodies except one, uh, that's his suspicion, uh, and that body is what haunts the pool. Uh, so Zeke has the idea to, uh, because it smells like acid, uh, it says if this presence is at all made of acid, then it will react with a certain chemical. He pours that chemical into the pool, and the corpse turns red. But it, but it can also turn into water or slime, a la Alex Mack, and get around that way. So they do the thing where they're running around. Uh, Charlie seems to, I don't think it's a heart attack, but he kind of passes out. Uh, and then um, I think it goes, I was not sure exactly what chemical reaction they were doing because I'm not good at chemistry, but it seemed that it was, that he, that uh, Zeke was trying to recreate the explosion from his first scene in the story with the volcano. 
so he um, he uh, gets this other chemical, it's powder, and he brings it um, to the pool, and uh, then he gets taken in by the monster, uh, and it's up to uh, Clarice to dump it on the monster, and uh, but she can't touch it without gloves because her hands are wet, so she has to get gloves, and meanwhile Zeke is being taken by the monster, but then Charlie saves Zeke, gets him out of the pool, and uh, Clarice powders the monster, and the monster is destroyed. And it's a good episode. Um, so, uh, and then in a kind of a nod to that, uh, while the uh, Midnight Society is voting on him, uh, Stig tastes the powder that's in the leather bag that they throw on the fire to make it go, to make it flare up for the titles of their stories, uh, which doesn't help his case. They say, it's not unanimous, but we'll give you another chance. Uh, and then someone says, take a shower. I think they say that. Um, and uh, so he's going to be given another chance, which is an interesting uh, thing for the Midnight Society. And that other chance is, of course, the tale of Station 109.1 .1 featuring Ryan Gosling. And Ryan Gosling is not even a, the main character in this. Uh, and it also features Gilbert Gottfried in, I guess, one of my favorite of his performances. Um, but I'll just go right into it. So the uh, so Stig has everyone bring a radio uh, boombox to the fire, and then he tells them all to turn it to their favorite station and play and turn it on all at once. So then there's a cacophony of different radio stations, all pretty much playing the same music, it sounds like. Um, and then he starts talking about, he has them all turn it off, and then he starts talking about radio signals and what can be hidden in radio signals. Uh, and then what if there's a message hidden in the radio signals that comes from beyond the grave. So, then we get into the story, the tale of Station 109.1 .1 featuring Ryan Reynolds. Uh, J uh, Chris, not played by Ryan Reynolds, likes to pretend to be dead. He's a very macabre kid, and this is kind of played as not a great thing. Uh, but there's not, nothing really wrong with it, but it's, it's played like you should get out more, that sort of thing. Um, so Chris uh, likes to pretend to be dead, lie down in his bed, cross his hands over his chest, he's got flowers around his bed, um, and then uh, Ryan Gosling's character, Jamie, is his brother, uh, works at, I guess, the, the family owns a, a uh, garage where cars come in to be fixed, um, and that's Ryan Gosling's character, uh, Jamie. Uh, and he looks exactly like Tom Felton, almost exactly like Tom Felton as Draco Malfoy in, let's say, the first four Harry Potter movies. Um, so that was, that helped. That was creepy. But it's, uh, so um, a hearse comes to the garage and Jamie decides to let Chris lie down in it because he knows Chris will be into it. But it's a prank because he locks the car and then turns it on with Chris in there and freaks Chris out. And Chris then manages to figure out what's going on, that he's been pranked, and then he turns off the car because the keys are in the ignition. But then after he turns off the car, the radio turns on, and it scans all the way up to 109.1. And then it's some kind of uh, channel for the interdimensionally challenged. Uh, and it seems to be uh, a message going out to the recently deceased. Uh, Jamie, while he is wandering away because he's done with his prank and he's just going to let Chris figure out his way out of the hearse, runs into a tall, uh, pale man who seems to be a ghost, says, Are, can, you, can you point me toward home? I'm looking for home, or something like that. And uh, Jamie just ignores him, walks away, says, sorry, can't, walks away. So the next day, Chris is tuning another radio all the way up to the station. Gets the, he manages to get the station. And then Jamie comes in and says, I want to listen to my radio program, because it was the 90s, and kids still le listened to radio programs, I guess. I don't know if I ever did. Um, so Jamie takes the radio, and then Chris goes to look up the, uh, the station, and it says that there's no current uh, station. There's no one currently is using that frequency. But there is an address to the last known uh, owner of that frequency. And naturally, Chris goes to the address. Um, he uh, goes down to the station, uh, sees a line of people who, it's pretty obvious, they're ghosts. And then Gilbert Gottfried, 
is on the other side of the door that says uh, do not knock on door or something like that uh, because his opening salvo is explaining why the kid should Chris shouldn't have knocked on the door and then he explains uh, the concept of lines and tells Chris to get in the line and Chris uh, you know still doesn't lose says, I'm just trying to figure this out and so uh, Gilbert Gottfried says and I'm gonna call him Roy because it's easier than saying Gilbert Gottfried over and over again uh, and uh, Chris uh, knocks on at the door and uh, Roy says come on in gives Chris a bracelet and says when your number is called you get to go on to the next life and then we see this guy being dragged uh, to like he this guy uh, goes comes in through the door that Chris has come in through and he's saying it's not my time you've got the wrong guy and then hooded black hooded figures come out uh, like in the mo like in the end of the movie ghost or in, throughout the movie ghost black hooded figures spectral figures come out and drag the guy through this ornate door and that is what we can assume will eventually happen to Chris and he will be yelling you've got the wrong guy I'm not dead except he'll mean it unlike the other person uh, so then Chris leaves and he goes back home but Jamie can't see him uh, and he puts his hand through Jamie he's he's a ghost now the uh, bracelet has cut him off from everything that ties him to the physical world as explained by Roy uh, then he goes through a door that leads him back to the station, he tries to escape the station, which has a sign that says, Do not smoke, which is uh, ironic for a place with ghosts. Uh, but also, it, shouldn't, it, sh it should read, Shouldn't have smoked. That would be uh, if I were designing the set. Um, and uh, then he goes through another door that leads to the radio setup. And we find out that uh, Roy, Gilbert Gottfried, has been doing the radio voice but I wouldn't have guessed that because it's a kind of Peter Lorre impression. But then we wa I, watching Roy do the Peter Lorre impression for the radio show, doing that voice, and it was it was hilarious. Um, he he's really the star of this uh, episode. Gilbert Gottfried is, uh, and so then he does his radio show and then he leaves, uh, and Chris then sits down at the radio uh, seat and uses the microphone and tries to figure out what's the frequency for the show that Jamie listens to every day at this time. And he apparently finds it out because he interrupts the the uh, show and he manages to reach Jamie. Jamie hears him, doesn't believe it at first, but then he runs into Dan Carpenter once again and eventually realizes that Dan Carpenter is the guy he met after he trapped Chris in the hearse, uh, that that was Dan Carpenter's hearse. He's dead, he's a ghost, but he doesn't know how to get to the next world, so he needs to be taken to the place. Jamie goes and looks at Chris's computer, finds the address, and then drives, uh, I, don't, I don't think they use the hearse, but he drives Dan Carpenter down to the station, and they get there. Black-robed spirits have grabbed Chris, like they grabbed the other guy because he's trapped in the station, and they're about to pull him through. Jamie arrives in time, uh, says, that's my brother, and then uh, Dan Daniel Carpenter says, yes, I was supposed to be in the hearse, not him. I'm supposed to be going on. You've got the wrong guy. And Gilbert Gottfried says no and has him tossed into the uh, place. But then the room starts to shake and Chris, the doors spit Chris back out. And uh, he says, uh, they said I was still alive. I didn't belong here. They said they want to talk to you. And uh, Roy has this uh, classic, uh-oh, I'm in trouble uh, thing. And then, uh, but then now Dan has to go through because that's the whole reason that he was there. And uh, he's on his way through, and I think it's Chris says, aren't you afraid it'll be horrible? And Gilbert Gottfried says, it's only horrible if you had a horrible life. So that's a nice little reading from him. Uh, so now we have Chris will now spend more time outside. So the lesson for Chris is that he needs to spend more time outside playing baseball with his brother, as opposed to his brother taking more of an interest in what he's interested in, as is always the case. Um... So uh, he releases it, I, you know, they, there's a little thing where he's got a bug in a jar. That's a mark of how weird he is at the beginning of the episode. He releases the bug, he goes off to play catch or baseball or whatever with his brother. And uh, then Stig says something about, if you don't let me in after that, uh, I forget what he says. Um, it's not really a threat, it's more of a, I don't know how to please you people. Um, 
He turns on his radio while they're deliberating. It plays what seems to be heavy metal, uh, and they, they all look over at him. He turns it off. They confer again, and then it's unanimous, and then he hugs one of them. Uh, so uh, Gary says to Tucker, because Tucker's the one who brought him in the first place. I forgot to mention that. If you can't keep him under control, I'll kick you both out. And that is where we end. And uh, that was it was that it was a very fun couple of episodes, uh, especially Gilbert Gottfried. And it's interesting to see young Ryan Gosling. So the next two episodes are called The Tale of the Mystical Mirror and The Tale of the Chameleons. And just from looking at them, I don't know uh, that I recognize their titles, but the guest stars in The Tale of the Chameleons are Tia and Tamara Maori. And so that's exciting. Uh, and I, chameleons, they, they change color. They don't transform to something else, but they're something, it's going to be something to do with twins. Uh, they play Janice, Janice slash the chameleon. So it is, I guess, uh, shape-shifting chameleons. Um, so that should be interesting. Pleasant dreams, everyone.